fellow Dream Chasers and Disney fans across the world, and welcome to the latest episode of Kingdom of Isolation, where in times of trouble, why not isolate yourself with the magic of Disney? Today, we are going to be heading to medieval London as we talk about the Sword in the Stone, released in 1963. But of course, it wouldn't be the Kingdom of Isolation without having a guest on board, as is tradition with this series. Uh, the other half of this fantastic power couple was here previously, covering uh, Peter Pan, which you can find in the Kingdom of Isolation playlist in the top right of your screens. He is my striking partner on the pitch, Deli Alley himself, Mr. Alistair Wayne. Alistair, welcome along. Hi, Fraser. Thanks for having me. It's great to be a part of the Kingdom of Isolation. Yeah, I think- a long time. I said, I said, yeah, I've, yeah, me too. I said, oh, I've been very much looking forward to having you and Beth uh, in, in the Kingdom of Isolation. I said, I got Beth on board to do uh, Peter Pan. I've got you here doing uh, Sword in the Stone and, uh, Oh, wait, uh, no, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on, it's just in. Oh, that's an, that's an interesting development. Apparently a slot's opened up for the Jungle Book. Oh, really? Which is a film that you wanted to cover as well. It was, it was, yeah, but then I thought it was filled up. Uh, yeah, I'll say, I'll say, but uh, but turns out uh, the, the person that was meant the person I was meant to be doing it with they've uh, they they've not got back to me yet on when they were able to record that episode with me. Okay, well, yeah. if you need me again, I'm always here for you, Fraser. There we go. I know, I know, I know. In some ways, folks, people are going to think, "Oh, you've just become a Disney villain because you've shafted somebody for somebody else." At least I have a reasonable excuse for it, folks. So that technically doesn't make me a villain. It's just, it's just more development to the character, folks. <laughs> there we go. Because sometimes you, sometimes you need to have that backup in place just in case something like this happens. Exactly. So that, does, that, does, that doesn't make me the villain, folks. That makes me a better hero in the grand scheme of things because I've always got a backup plan in place. <laughs> But anyway, uh, initial thoughts on Sword in the Stone before we start talking about the film in detail. Okay, well, I mean, I watched it um, a few weeks ago and then I, I recapped as you, you let me know that we're doing this today. And yeah, I really like the Sword in the Stone. I think it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a, a simple movie. It's obviously one of the early ones, isn't it? In the yeah. 60s. Um, and yeah, I, I obviously my first things was just thinking about when I watched it as a child and obviously enjoyed the songs and the and Merlin and and Arthur. So no, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching it back actually because a lot of childhood nostalgia came back as I was watching it. Yeah. So yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and 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 that's and that's one of the goals of the Kingdom of Isolation, folks, being able to trigger that. Um, nostalgic feeling of watching those films for the first time as kids and um news and uh, i will say this regarding uh, the renaissance period folks um i did speak i speak i spoke to uh, ali and uh, beth um a f a f about, about a week ago or so uh when when they wished me uh, when they wished me a happy birthday i'm now 28 years old now <laughs> uh but yeah um I spoke to them and they are and they are both going to be in the Kingdom of Isolation with me when we talk about Aladdin when we get to the Renaissance era of films. Mm -hmm. I've only got like I've only got like about a dozen films left to cover before I get into the Renaissance period. But uh, but yeah, uh, so we've, we've still got a few films to cover beforehand. The next episode is going to be The Jungle Book. Uh, but we're going to talk about Sword in the Stone just um, uh, for today. And then we'll then. And then, and then I'll probably need like um, a, a few days to get it all edited together to incorporate the footage from the film, etc. Uh, and of course, to be on, and of course, as always, spoiler alert in place if you haven't seen the film yet. So <laughs> let's see if we are worthy of, let's see if we're worthy of being King of England as we talk about the sword in the stone. Brilliant. So, um... Uh, so once the so once the opening credits are out of the way, folks, we have a, we have a storybook opening which we haven't seen since Sleeping Beauty, back in nineteen fifty nine. And then of course you've got, and then of course you've got um, uh, a solo. I would assume I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a baritone voice, um, is establishing the story that we're going to be um, uh, involved with. Uh, the king at the time uh, sadly passed away, and. Uh, England's on the verge of war, and then, lo and behold, 
the Arthurian legend of the sword in the stone. And you've, and you've got um, who saw pull of this stone from this uh, sword and anvil is right wise king born of England. And a lot of people, uh, a lot of, a lot, a lot of strong, burly men, a lot of like, yes, I can try and pull this, but try as they might, nobody can do it. Nobody can pull that sword out. And then it gets to the point where the sword is just forgotten about o- over time. So then we get in, so then we get introduced to, um, then we get introduced to the, some, some of the, char- the, some of the main characters that we're going to be focusing on throughout the film. You've got, uh, we, see, we see Merlin trying to get water from a well. He's voiced by Carl uh, Svensson, or Swenson, however you pronounce it, folks. Um, and some, some of the things, I think he is probably one of the best written uh, mentor characters, if you will. He's, he's one of the best mentor, best written mentor characters, uh, and not, not just from his uh, words of wisdom, but also from a comedic standpoint as well uh, everything everything from almost falling into the well to to the ridiculous to the uh, at the time ridiculous things about um uh, about the future some of which i also have uh in my notes folks so i will be bringing my notes up on a on a um, on a regular basis throughout this um um so so, so when we so when we see him on screen for the first time, uh, Ali, uh, what were your initial? What was your what was your first impressions of um, uh, of Merlin? What um, what was your first impressions of Merlin? Well, um, I think <laughs> I think like obviously like I said before, um, he's a very memorable character. It's probably him and Archimedes the Owl are the are for me the MVPs of the movie. They are the the ones that. Are my favourites, um, and like they work really well together as a duo, don't they? Because Merlin is um, obviously quite, he's a caring character, but he's also, I, I think he's a bit all over the place as a character as well. And Archimedes is quite a cynical character, has the owl as his companion, and it's quite a good. Um, a lot of the most of the laughs of the movie come from there. I think Archimedes teasing Merlin and correcting him. So no, it's it's good. Like um. Like I said, it's it's an introduction to the character, and you find out more about them as the movie goes along. But it's, um, yeah, just a solid introduction with a bit of humor as well, which is a constant throughout the movie when it comes to Merlin and Archimedes. Yeah, and uh, and talking of Archimedes, I mean, I mean, th- throughout a majority of the film, he well, throughout the first half of the film especially, he just comes across as just really, really, really a bit of a sourpuss. If you yeah. will, he's voiced. He's voiced by Junius, Junius Matthews, and and you just got to think to yourself. I mean, you just got to think to yourself. Could he be any more sour if he tried? He's just, he's just like, uh, it's like a couple of points. It's like, uh, I say we go back to the woods, and he's like, ah, uh, just this, that, and the other. And you just got to think, gee whiz, gee whiz, our committee's just brighten up for once. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, you're right. Yeah, and uh, as I, I mentioned brief, I mentioned briefly about uh, something from the comedic standpoint from uh, from Merlin. Uh, yeah, I say it's um, no plumbing, no electricity, to which I put in my regular, regular, um, regular mention of fun notes I took throughout the film. Merlin, you do realize what year you're in, right? <laughs> Well, is the year actually? Do you know? It's like it looks like Middle Ages, isn't it? So like yeah. ten hundred or something. Yeah, because it's really so, so probably so, yeah. somewhere in that sort of uh, probably somewhere in that sort of region. But um, yeah. but see, then he but see, then he has this um, he has this uh, incredible uh, he has this vision of well I, I, I would say vision, but it's sort of like um, uh, transitioning into a, a different scene through the uh, the smoke that comes out of his pipe uh, of uh, who he's uh, expecting a meeting from. And that's when we see the next two characters introduced uh, in the film. You've got uh, you've got Kay, who's training to be a knight, uh, <clears throat> voiced by Norman Alden, and then you've got and then you've got the main protagonist of the film himself. You've got Arthur, who actually had three voice actors. Believe mm-hmm. it or not, he had Ricky Sorensen and Richard and Robert Reitherman. Uh, Richard and Robert are. They are, 
are they like um, uh, the sons of uh, sons or grandsons, whatever, of um, Wolfgang Ratherman, who was the director uh, of the film. Now, you probably think to yourselves, folks, how did they end up with three voice actors for one particular, for just the one uh, character? Well, the thing with that is, is that uh, so they, so this is what this is what we've got here. Um, and was, uh, was like, Arthur also has the uh, nickname of uh, Wart, which is established right out of the gate thanks to uh, Key. Um, uh, and he is what he's one of the many characters that I've uh, uh, discussed throughout uh, this series so far. He is one of those characters that is, for lack of a better word, irredeemable. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, everything from how he everything from how he speaks to uh, Arthur to how he treats him at the same time. It's, so you just got to think, good grief, like, just really unlikable and really uh, irredeemable at the same time. But nevertheless, um, Arthur voiced by three actors leading to notice, noticeable changes in voice between the scenes and sometimes within the same scene at the same time. Like, like, the, like the change of um, like the, the change of tone. Uh, somewhat, uh, as I, as I, now I'm not sure which actor did which particular part of um, uh, uh, the film, but um, I say it's, it's, it's one of the one of those issues where uh, when they were in the process of making the film and doing the voice acting work, um, uh, a, ca a case of puberty uh, hitting um, one or two of the uh, uh, voice actors, and that's why you ended up with. Uh, one or two others on board to help her continue um, recording uh, the dialogue to try and keep the voice as consistent as possible. But even that wasn't, but even that wasn't possible given the fact that, uh, like I say, three voice actors for like one character. Yeah, not uh, not ideal when you've got somebody that's just on the verge of their voice um, uh, breaking. But uh, despite that, uh, the voice actors, they did well. They did well with what they had, despite the, um, uh, the growth and development they were having uh, physically. And uh, they, they really, the voice actors as a whole for, um, uh, for Arthur, they, I, I, feel they, I feel they did a fantastic job bringing the character to life as best they could. No, I agree. Um, to be fair, I, like, obviously, Preparing for this, I read up a bit, and that's where I discovered that there was three voice actors for the the one character, which is Arthur. Mm -hmm. And I, when I was watching it before, I knew that I didn't really tell. I couldn't tell like the change in tones and the change in voices. So I think they did a good job in the film of, I guess, you know, covering it up and obviously picking voice actors who had similar voices and tones. So because it wasn't. I mean, when you do watch videos and they, they show it, yeah, it is noticeable when you when you dig deep and look and analyze it. But watching the movie, just not knowing, yeah, I couldn't tell. So it was well done in that regard. Yeah. Um, so so Kate right now is right right now. Kate is in the process of um, doing some hunting, and uh, Arthur's just decided, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna come along as well because I can. Uh, and then the deer he's hunting, you just got to think, uh, I, initially, I initially thought, wait a minute, is, isn't that Bambi's mom? Didn't she get uh, uh, shot by, uh, yes, man, man, but someone has your hamster if he could. Nostalgia critic fans will get that particular reference. Uh, but um, I was like, I was like what, wasn't, wasn't Bambi's mom like shot off screen rather than being killed by a bow and, bow and arrow? Unless it's unless it's a different deer, maybe it's Feline, Bambi's love interest. For all we know, I mean, I mean, I mean, we we could we could debate that one in the comments, folks. We could debate that one in the comments. Uh, Arthur falls off. Arthur falls off the branch, um, effectively uh, making uh, K miss his shot, and uh, and the dean and the deer just uh, runs off. Um, and then. And then Arthur decides go into the woods to try and retrieve the arrow, and there, and then you've got, and then you've got this wolf. Uh, it's, it's a running gag throughout, running gag throughout the film where he's trying to, he's trying to, he's trying to eat Arthur. And then um, I was like, 
I got I got some serious wily e. coyote vibes. Yeah. Just like, same. Just like, just like eating his bone, and then he sees uh, the Arthur taking on the uh, Roadrunner role, if you will, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and, and, and tries he and tries he right everything from a branch, be everything from a branch being whacked into his face, and then another branch. <laughs> and then he, he, try he tries to uh, catch Arthur in his mouth, and then it ends up being a branch in his mouth instead. And I was like, it just <clears throat> he's. He's, he's one of he's one of the funniest mute side characters, uh, if you will. But uh, yeah, let's just say what <laughs> uh, there's one particular point later on in the film where he ends up uh, the way he screams. Um, uh, okay, so, so I'll, I'll I'll bring that bit up later. But let's just say you could say it's uh, effectively the prototype to the human goat scream, folks. <laughs> and, and and if you if you listen if you listen to the wolf screaming at that particular point compared to the human goat scream, yeah, you can probably you can probably hear how similar they are. But we'll we'll get to that we'll get to that uh, shortly. Uh, Arthur's on the verge of retrieving the arrow, and then he falls through the roof, and then has his meeting with uh, Merlin. Uh, but um, <laughs> um. Then, then after their meeting, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> voice is uh, still a bit somewhat uh, short after uh, just recording my reaction to the latest episode of, episode of Falcon and Winter Soldier. Whew. I won't go into too much detail, but uh, let's just say you might want to watch the reactions afterwards. <laughs> Good job I stocked up on beverages uh, for such a situation. <clears throat> but yeah, uh, after their meeting, um, I mean, I mean, I mean, you could say that the um, uh, so like the mini song, if you will, uh, over the um, the storybook opening, like sort of like the first song, like the first like proper full length song, if you will, folks. Uh, second song in the soundtrack, anyway. Uh, Hockety pockety wockety whack. Um, this is this is just part of the genius of the Sherman Brothers. Uh, who actually wrote the songs for this film, but it wouldn't be the last time we see them uh, writing the songs for like a, a Disney film. They've done Mary Poppins. They've done The Jungle Book. They even did The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh as well. <clears throat> so uh, I think uh, so you, can, you, can you can add those two names to the list of uh, longtime Disney collaborators. Uh, I say, I say it's, the, it's, the, uh, it's the unorthodox way they get... Um, they get the words to uh, start rhyming uh, with each other through the um, uh, th throughout 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 that uh, song, and I say it, it was like I say the way they get the words to rhyme, even though some of the words do not make any sense at all. Uh, I say it just adds to the genius of the Sherman Brothers, <clears throat> and uh, but. Um, but then you've got, but then you've got that little, um, you've got that little uh, sugar pot, what you call it, uh, like the sugar container. Uh, he, he just like forces his way to the front of the uh, the crocodile. He's just like, mm, 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 get behind me! And Merlin's just like, whoa, 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 hey, hey, stop that! The tea set's already cracked enough. Uh, small problem with that, Merlin. We don't see any of those said cracks. So if you're gonna bring so dare I say if you're gonna bring it up in dialogue, at least bring it, at least actually show the cracks on screen. Otherwise, the line doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so sorry, sorry, that's that's just me going into Tom and Jerry nitpicky mode. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, uh, <clears throat> finishes finish the song, manages to get manages to get everything pack, packed up in his Mary Poppins esque bag. Do you, do you think? Do you think that's? Do you think that's where they got the uh, the idea of that sort of uh, bag from? Because uh, because Mary Poppins would be released a, uh, the following year, and and given the fact that I would assume both films were in production at the same time, uh, yeah. So do, you, do you think? Do you think they took that idea from Mary Poppins and then incorporated it here? Uh, I think it's a good it's a good chance. Yeah, I know that there's um watching it. There's a lot of um like obviously it's quite an early film, isn't it? So there's a lot of ideas which um, brought to mind other Disney films that would happen in the future. So obviously, because yeah. 
I do think the one of the strengths of the film is the animation for its time it was very, very good um, for like the early 60s. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, but like, and we'll go on to scenes where we'll talk about it in more depth. But yeah, there's definitely scenes where yeah. you can see they've copied it back. Yeah, Re recycle, yeah recycled animation. You'll say, you'll say Disney, yeah. es especially at this point in their... Um, in their film in their filmmaking you can definitely see that they they were they were very notorious if you will with their recycling um animation but um as I, I mean i mean it's just another excuse for them to try and uh, save as much money as possible i mean i mean this film only had a three million dollar budget back then and of course back then a three million dollar budget for an animated film it's it's quite a fair chunk of change especially and, and if it ends up not doing well at the box office yeah you could run into problems later down the road but um <clears throat> but um arthur get arthur gets back to the arthur gets back to the castle and this is where we get introduced to the other uh a uh, co-antagonist of uh, the film, and that is Lord Ector, voiced by uh, Sebastian Cabot. Um, and the, the, the interesting thing in the notes here is that it, he, in a way, he cares for Arthur, but uh, often treats him like a servant rather than uh, a son. And Cabot also uh, provided the narration at the beginning and the end of the film. Oh wow! Didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was say, like, I say, like, and it wouldn't be the only time he would do anything uh, narration uh, related because he would also be the narrator throughout the many adventures of uh, uh, Winnie the Pooh. Wow. Oh. So, so yeah, there's there's that as well, and you also get um, you also get uh, see, so there's a couple of other characters to introduce. Uh, as well, uh, you've got the scullery maid of uh, uh, the castle, voiced by uh, Barbara Jo Allen, who, if I'm right in saying, has done some Disney projects previous uh, to this animation. Uh, yes, she has. She was also the voice of uh, Fauna, one of the three fairies in Sleeping Beauty. So... But of course, back of course, back to the back to the main plot of the film. Um, Lord Ector gives um, <clears throat> uh, gives Arthur some uh, uh, demerits. Um, that the only the only way I mean, realistically, the only way you'd be getting demerits is if you were like um, not exactly very well behaved uh, at school, especially stateside. But um, but demerits for being late coming back home. It's a bit extreme, mm -hmm. but um, but then he get, but then Hector gets uh, introduced to uh, Merlin and some of the some of the antics that uh, some of the antics that Merlin pulls off to try and convince Hector to let him uh, uh, like let him stay for uh, <clears throat> uh, to, to let him stay in the castle. As I, as it further adds to the um, uh, comedic side of um, of Merlin, and and then and then and, and then you just got Kay sitting there. He's just he's just sitting there eating his chicken. He's just like, yeah, whatever. Don't. I'm, I'm. He's like, yeah, whatever. Not interested. Yeah. And but uh, and then Merlin convinces Hector to let let him stay, uh, and they give him they give him a uh, <laughs> they give him they give him a they give him like a, a like a castle tower, which you can clearly see is just falling apart completely. Uh, a, a revamp, doesn't it? It's very, uh, it's very leaky. It, yes, uh, <laughs> despite despite the despite the fact it's meant to be uh, blazing hot weather, um, according to Hector. And then we cut to the and then the next scene we see Merlin trying to plug up all the leaks with like various containers, even the little even the little uh, sugar holder. As well, yeah. uh, and, 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 and even just little, even just little uh, gags like that, just just to get a good chuckle. I mean, I mean, I mean, the sugar's pretty much um, 
saturated at this point that um, does, doesn't stop the sugar holders. Just like, hey, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm full of water. Get it out, get it out, get it out. Puts the lid back on. He's just like, Merlin, why are you up? <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but say, and, then, and then we continue seeing Archimedes just being ridiculously sour. But, um, but and then, of course, you've got... Um, uh but they, so one of the other things that I one of the other things that I noticed uh as well throughout uh, throughout this film is that there's like there's like a particular sound bite from Arthur um I say so I'm, so I'm, ju I'm just gonna just gonna play that uh uh gonna play that briefly I say, well, what? Oh! I say, that, that particular sound bite has been it's like used like about half a dozen times throughout the entire Film. So not only did we have the recycled animation, which Disney were you know, notorious for back then, but you also had in this film in particular recycled dialogue, the same soundbite for Arthur whenever he ended up um, having a fall. Which is really, it's really bizarre that they'd actually go as far as recycling the dialogue on top of recycling the animation that they've used in previous films at the same time. Um, but, um, but the next day, Merlin, edu Merlin starts educating, um, he starts educating uh, Arthur. Uh, and, and, you've, and, and this is where you see, a, there's a lot of uh, chicanery and shenanigans with each uh, transformation that uh, that Arthur has everything from being transformed into a fish and then he gets transformed into a squirrel, transformed into a bird at one point as well. And, um, and, and the words of wisdom he, uh, Merlin passes along, uh, please don't kill me, Tamatoa, for this. Uh, I've, I've, used this I've used this gag numerous, I've used this gag numerous times for, I'll say, um, I'll say Tamatoa uh, from uh, Moana folks. Uh, I'll say Merlin decides to... Uh, Decides to teach. <clears throat> right, <clears throat> bear with, bear with me. Once I uh, get the right wording for this, Merlin decides to teach Arthur about. Um, so decides to teach him various things. Decides to educate him in song form. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I've, I've, I've used that particular line numerous times. Um, I, think, I, think, I, I actually, I actually need to incorporate that Tamatoa clip at some point. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm going to end up incorporating it when I talk about Moana eventually, anyway. But, um, but yeah, as they're educated in their song form, and you've got very uh, and and this further adds to the uh, creativity of the soundtrack for the um, uh, for for the film because uh, because because you have like the first so track, uh, Sword in the Stone, Higgins Figures. Uh, that's what makes the world go round. That's where you've got. That's where he's. Um, uh, bear with me, folks. Uh, bear with me. Um, that's what makes the world go round. That's the song that's used when uh, Arthur is a fish, uh, a most befuddling thing. That's when he's a squirrel. Um, but uh, the the whole squirrel scene. It's, let's see. Da, 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 da. I, I found that um, phrase of the, the scroll seemed to be quite um, sad in the end. Um, yeah. That's how it ends. It ends quite abruptly. Yeah. Because obviously the, yeah, like the the girl squirrel has a fascination with Arthur as yeah. the squirrel. And then I think the girl squirrel actually in the end saves Arthur from the wolf, doesn't she? Yes, right? yeah. yes, he does. Yeah, um, yeah. but um, let's say, let's say, let's say, the one redeeming thing that the one redeeming thing that uh, Archimedes actually did was actually save um, Arthur from that huge barracuda esque fish. Pike wasn't a thing, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. And and I actually was a um, was a uh, fun note number two today, folks. Finally, Archimedes does something useful. <laughs> in all well, caps, 
in all caps, by the way, folks. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, the, um, uh, but of course, in between, in between all of that, I say, but uh, the squirrel scene is, I say the squirrel scene, it's, uh, say, I'm just like, why do I'm I'm sitting here like why do I relate to that scene so much? I've been in that squirrel's I've been in that girl squirrel's position three times now, and that I've I've been in that position three times now since the um since joining the since since joining the church. Every relationship I've been in, all th- all three relationships I've been in, um since since joining the church, folks. Because uh, yes, we're both members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Uh, every relationship that I've had has always resulted in the person I was dating at the time. They're the ones that break. They're the ones that break up with me rather than the other way around. And then, yeah, it gets. And then, of course, sort sort of cliched um, that it gets it gets twisted where it looks like where it looks like I'm the one that was uh, in the wrong. Every single time, and then people, and then people wonder why I'm. Then people wonder why I don't have a good track relationship with uh, a good track record with relationships, and why I'm hardly in a relationship, because I always have this hap. I've always had that happen to me. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry for a split second there. I thought I thought the uh, the mic had disconnected, but we're fine. We're fine. Um, let's see, there is, let's see, there is, there, there is a uh, some, there is some uh, hilarious, there is some uh, funny comeuppance for uh, Lord Ector and um, Kate, uh, uh, Lord uh, Ector and Kate. Um, there is some funny comeuppance for them um, while all this is happening uh, away away from the castle. Uh, the scullery maid is just like ah, the dishes of. The dishes have been, uh, uh, what, whatever it is. Um, the, the dishes of the dishes are committing witchcraft. They're cloning themselves, and I don't know how. And then, and then, Ector and Kay go down, and they're just like, "What in the blazes is going on here?" And then, <laughs> the comeuppance is that, the, uh, let's just say they get a good scrub up, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ector in the um in the basin where the dishes are being cleaned. And then you've got Kay who ends up uh, becoming a mop head. Quite <laughs> literally, if you will, because his head is actually stuck in the mop. And then he's just like, and then, and then just one last bit of irredeemability. He's just like swipes the handle and the mop just falls to the ground. Yeah. And, 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 the, and the final straw for Ector is... Because of everything that's happened, he decides to have somebody else be K Squire instead of Arthur or Wart, as they keep calling him throughout the film. Yeah. But uh, but, but I say, but back to the squirrel scene quickly for for, for a moment. Um, let's say, let's say I, the only word I could really use to describe that the whole squirrel scene is just it's just a, it's just absolutely adorable. And uh, and it's and it's at this point it's at this point with the uh, the thing I mentioned about the the wolf screaming earlier today. This is the point in the film where you end up with that uh, prototype human goat scream. I mean, so what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to play that scream. I'm actually going to show how that scream plays out in the film, and then I'm going to like tweak a little bit, tweak it a little bit, and have that same clip but use the human goat scream. <laughs> Uh, and of course, Ali. Will, of course, Ali won't be able to see this uh, in action until um, until I've got it yeah, all, all until I've got it all yeah. edited together. These these yeah. videos do take time to put together, folks. The joy oh, the joys of being dude. a YouTuber. These things take time to put together. You can't just expect them to be done within the hour, <laughs> Un- unless you're, unless you're somehow able to do a reaction of Avengers, uh, the Avengers, End- the first Avengers Endgame trailer about 15 minutes after the trailer was released. Oh wait, oh. I did that. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Impressive. Okay. Okay. And, and that and that was and that was all 
I actually got that reaction recorded, edited, and uploaded onto my channel within the hour. And that was all before heading to Dundee for, uh, for a winter ball up there. Wow. Mind you, mind you, mind you, that was uh, about two and a half years ago now. Uh, hope, hopefully not too much longer before lockdown ends for good and then we can actually go to these events again. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. But... Um, uh, boom, 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 boom. But the, um, <clears throat> You're talking about the rural scene, right? Yeah, and the, uh, the wolf dream. Yes, that, 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 yes, that's that's where we're up to now. Um, well, I mean, we have skipped, I guess, because the squirrel scene is after the fish scene, isn't it? Is that yes. the, the RDS? So we've kind of skipped ahead, but yeah. obviously they're kind of like the, the scenes where they turn to animals is obviously, like you said, Merlin mentoring <laughs> Arthur. I say, I say, I say, I say, I say, I say those, those scenes there, they're, they're all connected. And like I say, I say everything, everything that happens with the, the dishes in the, um, uh, in the castle, that's all happening in between those yeah. uh, animal scenes. And then, and then, uh, and then Arthur talking about, talking about his dreams, uh, one of them being dream of flying. That's when he gets turned into a bird. And, um, yeah, I like, the things Merlin mentions here, talking about talking about the future. I am convinced at this point. I am convinced that Merlin was Disney's prototype to Doctor Emmett Brown from the Back to the Future trilogy. <laughs> could have, yeah, well, could, could have been. Love yeah. that film as well. Yeah, I say, like, I like, the Back to the Future trilogy is easily one of the best trilogies in the whole of um in the whole of film in general yeah definitely i love it yeah it's good and um and, and while and while Mer, and while arthur is learning how to be a bird with the help of archimedes this time mm -hmm. rather than um uh, rather than merlin teaching him since archimedes is already a bird um yeah it's um uh, so while Archimedes is teaching uh, Arthur, they end up encountering a hawk, and uh, and and Arthur's just like yeet and just legs it out of there. Uh, ends up ends up on a chimney of an of a house back in the forest that we were in towards the start of the film, uh, and then and then the hawk manages to find him again, and um, <laughs> and then and then Arthur just yeets through the chimney. Covered in suit, and this is where we're introduced to Madam Mim, who is voiced by. If I can get the cast list up, Madam Mim, whereabouts are we? There we go, Martha Wentworth. That is who voices uh, Madam Mim, who's uh, a proficient witch in uh, black magic. Complete contrast to um, Merlin and how he uses his magic. Yeah. No, and I mean, she's a brilliant character. Um, I think as I was like watching it, I remembered her. So I was like waiting for her to come. And she's quite near the end of the movie, really. She she only has a short um, screen in time, but um, she makes a massive impact, I think. I think she's a great character. Yeah, absolutely. And then... And, and then... Uh... Okay, and, the, and then the, the various transformations that uh, that Mim pulls off to her uh, self-titled song, if you will, her the the marvelous Mad Madam Mim, and yeah, oh boy, <laughs> uh, Merlin Merlin comes in and is just like, uh, get your hands off of that boy, and then we get to for me the best scene in the entire film. The Absolutely. wizard's duel that these two have, it is comedy gold. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's easily, I think as I was watching it, like, um, yeah, it's easily the best scene in the film. And what I love about it is as they turn to different animals, the face of the animals are very recognizable of being yeah. Merlin and Madame Mims. Like the animation is really good. Yeah, um, quite pioneering, really, isn't it? For the yeah. time, just, 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 and of course, and of course, the way the animators were able to 
make those transformations. Again, this is back, this is back before they were able to use computers to do this sort of thing on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, but of course, but of course they had, uh, they had moved away from the, uh, the standard inking uh, process for films like Snow White, Pinocchio, Cinderella. They had gone on to a new animation process that they had used in, uh, bear with me, um, a, a new animation, uh, the Xerox animation process where um, uh, for 101 Dalmatians, which I covered in the previous episode. I mean, I mean, yes, in, yes, in some ways for, for some of the backgrounds, especially uh, the backgrounds don't look um, the backgrounds don't look as uh, polished uh, as some some of the um, some of the previous films. Speaking of which, I should have done this. I should have done that earlier. There we go. There we go. Yes, I am. In, yes, I am. Ex- I, <laughs> yeah, I'll say. I'll say. I'll say. It's, um, I'll say, I'll say I'm, I'm continuing to find ways to improve uh, making these episodes. Everything from like having my having my guest with me uh, using using Zoom, of course. Uh, to incorporating uh, footage from the film, to having like uh, concept, having like so like concept art from uh, the films uh, that we're uh, discussing. So yeah, I say, I say, just, I, say I, I now need to work out. I say, I, say, I mean, this begs the question: How can I further improve? How can I further improve the series? Because right, because right now I'm sort of like at the first peak that I've got everything I can. As far as being able to uh, make make these episodes as best as as best they can be, uh, I mean, I mean, I could just as easily incorporate the score from the um, the score from the um, from the films, but but then of course that runs the risk of uh, copyright, and we know how protective Disney can be with their copyright, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to showing footage from the films, but. Um, We'll see. We'll see what we can do, but uh, but yeah. Um, but the, the wizard's jewel just the, the yeah. animals they transform into. They they already established the they established the rules. Uh, uh, no no disappearing. No make believe stuff. Uh, and of yeah. course and of course Merlin puts. Not, of course, not pink dragon wasn't it? So no purple yeah, dragon. yeah, pink dragon. Yeah, that's mad. Of it. And then of course Merlin puts in rule four: no cheating. And uh, and what does Madame decide to do? Uh, like uh, t- ten pieces, standard Western shootout stuff. But lo and behold, she decides to disappear right out the gate, breaking one of her rules in the process. And you just and I'm just like, you 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 specifically said no disappearing, and then you break that the rule you set for every. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah, she's well. She technically broke two rules there because a she disappeared and b she cheated by not abiding by the rules that she had set. There we go. You're right. But uh, yeah, <laughs> but uh, so the, the, the things they transform into everything from uh, crocodiles, rabbits, uh, a yeah. walrus, walrus, chicken, yeah. uh, elephants, mice. Um, I, th- I, th- I, th- I think it's like I think it's like a hippo at one point, and then yeah. Merlin turns into a goat, and then uh dear, and then and then my exact words in the notes, curse those wretched loopholes. She 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 said no pink dragons, but she didn't say anything about purple dragons. Yeah, it's like I said, curse those wretched loopholes. <laughs> but um, that I, I technically. In a way, Merlin does break the no disappearing rule, but it's again, it's another lo- it's another loophole. He transforms himself into a German, makes Mim really, really ill. The spots, the hot and cold flashes, and the violent sneezing. And uh, yeah, that violent sneeze ends up burning one of the trees down. Mm-hmm. Almost, almost uh, toasting um, Blumen Archimedes and uh, uh, Arthur, Arthur himself. I. Goodness me! Not now, Dan Forden. Dan Dan Forden with his blooming toasties from Mortal Kombat. <laughs> oh, and don't worry, folks. I will be reviewing the new Mortal Kombat film coming out later this month. Brilliant. And one, I, one thing, one thing I wanted to add to that phrase around um, uh-huh. was so with the Wizard's Jewel. Um, 
it was kind of like early in the scene as well when there were when there were the fishers because obviously when there were the fish um arthur and merlin and um, the the main i guess the main mentoring and the main i guess learning that merlin yep. wanted to teach to arthur during the fish scene was mm -hmm. that no matter how small you are um compared to your opponent you can Brain. use the power of the mind doesn't it Brain over the your opponent. that's it and then in the wizard duel merlin against madame mim that's what merlin showcases doesn't he there that you go putting, the, putting those words of wisdom into practice exactly exactly so yeah um so yeah so yeah wizard's duel's over uh mim's in bed thermometer should 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 be better in a few weeks and uh I, he just Merlin decides to uh, sort of like put a little hole in the roof, if you will, to to let the sun shine in, and uh, it, that's and that and that and that's the last we see of uh, that's the last we see of Madame Mim. Yeah. Uh, and Good then cameo, wasn't it? Impactful cameo for Madame Mim. Yeah. Really good. Yeah, and then Christmas Eve rolls around. Uh, Kay is. K is knighted, and this is all before the uh, the New Year's Day tournament that's uh, that's going to be used to uh, crown the new uh, King of England. But um, and of course, this tournament's in place because this they've effective everyone's effectively forgotten about the legend of the sword and the stone. But um, saying it turns out on Christmas Eve, the the night before Christmas as well, Hobbs, who was going to be um, who was going to be uh, uh, K Squire? No, not Jason Statham Hobbs. Get that out of here. <laughs> of all the Hobbs to bring up, why did it have to be Jason Statham? That's not the Hobbs we're talking about. Uh, it's... I wish it was. Love that film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I say, um, I say Hobbs, who was uh, going to be Arthur's replacement, ends up coming down with a case of the mumps. And as a result of this, Arthur gets reinstated. And uh, despite, um, uh, despite Arthur being really happy about this, Merlin, not so much because he's led to assume that Arthur is more interested in the war games than rather than having a rather than having a proper education. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then Merlin's just like, "Blow me to Bermuda," and then just. And then try, and then heads off to Bermuda in the 20th century, which he brings up at the end of the film. Um in effectively like a firework. Hmm. A very angry and oversized firework. Yeah. But uh but yeah. Um and that but that but that ends up leaving um Arthur with um with uh, Archimedes. And um, yeah, and then onto the onto the day of the tournament as well. And then Arthur has a realization that he left Kay's sword at the inn. And Kay's just like, you, sorry, you, sorry, you what? <laughs> and Arthur, they go back to the inn. They try to get the sword, but because every everything is closed because of the tournament, uh, Archimedes points out uh, the, a sword that's in a church in the um, that's in the churchyard, which you can see here. Um, they decide to go for that, and then you see this light coming from this 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 light coming from the sky, heavenly choir and all. Um, and that and that leads you to believe that yeah, Arthur's the one that was destined to pull the sword from the stone, and he ends up pulling it because he's like because he's like come on, look, we need to give Kay a sword. He pulls it out, and then and then hands it to Kay, and Kay's just like, uh, no, that's not my sword. But the way he's holding it, Ector reads what's inscribed on that sword, and then he's like. Wait a minute! That's the sword in the stone. At this, and uh, any time they, any time anybody mentions the name of the film, I put, I've always put, I always put it into my notes. Roll credits. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, um, 
after that's uh, after that's out of the way, um, they they go back to the churchyard. Hector puts the sword back into the uh, stone and anvil, and then Kay's just like, no, no, no. If you were able to pull it out, surely anybody can pull it out now. But um, try as they might, anybody that tries to pull it, even Hector himself, he's just like, yeah, that's not good. And then one of the knights in the background is just like, oh, let, let, let's let's give the let's give the youngster a chance. Let's give Arthur a chance. And then they actually, and then everyone's there to see him pull the sword from the stone twice now. And and then there's the miracle. Arthur is the king of England, wow. and and then Hector tries to redeem himself uh, and ask Arthur for, for for forgiveness. And again, this is this is another note that I put in all caps. Why would anyone want to forgive you after the way you treated him? And I am including Kay in that as well. Ec- the way Hector and Kay treated him throughout the film, um. Hector just going to the extremes as far as um, uh, punishments are concerned. Uh, like uh, f- four demerits, six, ten demerits at one point. Uh, and then and then Kay just... Uh, we've already established how irredeemable he is. Yeah. But my word. Um, like I say, why would anyone want to forgive those two after everything they put him through throughout the film? And then while and then Arthur's just Arthur's sitting there on his throne, uh, w- with the crown and all, and he's just like, uh, I didn't ask for this to happen." And Archimedes, in a way, does talk a bit of sense. He's like, uh, "Yeah, I did say you should have kept the sword in. I, you should you should have left the sword where it was." But um, but then Merlin comes back from um, Bermuda and the twentieth century. Um, he's um, and then he he gives Arthur some uh, reassurance, and he and he breaks the fourth wall, guys. Um, books, uh, motion pictures, this, that, and the other. And I'm sitting here like, Arthur just broke the fourth wall. <laughs> and, and and it was a case that yeah, uh, and 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 that motion picture was what we had, was what he, we had uh, just watched. And um, and then and then camera zooms out. Hail King Arthur, long live the king! And there we go. That's the end of the film. Not there bad for uh, not bad for just over an hour talking about the film. Yeah. So uh, yeah, now we get and uh, and of course this is the point where I go back to the Kingdom of Isolation logo right there. There we go. Uh, virtual backgrounds on Zoom, wonderful thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I say yeah, I mean, yeah, yes, I've used the virtual backgrounds on. Um, uh, on a number of occasions, uh, there was even one point where I even had uh, even had the virtual background of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco for the, uh, for institute classes. <laughs> uh, I, I even had a Zoom background of the uh, the wallpaper that's used for uh, Andy's bedroom in Toy Story. But yeah, anyway, on to the parts that I'm sure you guys are very much looking forward to: the scores and what uh, the scores for each of the sections, the five sections as always, story, characters, visuals, soundtrack, and of course, the legacy of the film. Put all those scores together to come up with a percentage and we see where it comes up on the board, Dang. on the scoreboard. So a um, couple of episodes ago, we had Sleeping Beauty, the first film to exceed 100% at 102. That is currently at the top of the board at the moment. Um, but we'll see where the sword and the stone lies amongst all of that. Um, so story, story I always um, start off with. Now I, I gave it, um, I, say, I, I gave, I gave the, I gave the story section uh, an eight. That um, I mean, I mean, yes, I say, it's, a, it's a great, I say, it's, it's a great uh, adaptation of the uh, the Arthurian. Um, the, Arth- the Arthurian legend, but um, overall, I just felt it was. I just felt it was a. I felt they could have like expanded it a bit more, uh, giving us a, uh, giving us a bit more uh, time to help like uh, develop, uh, d- develop the story. Uh, so, so like help flesh out the setting of the, the, the film. Like exp- try potentially find ways to like expand on the Arthurian legend, as well. Um, but of course, uh, this this was based on uh, 
This was based on the book by uh, by T. H. White. He he was the one that wrote the um uh, the book that the film was uh, was based on. Um, but I feel I was, I, was, I, was, I don't know I don't know too much about the I don't know too much about the source material um, itself, but um, overall, as far as the story is concerned, I feel they could have uh, tried to expand on the Arthurian legend a bit more. I feel I feel that the film could have been like ten minute about ten minutes longer, if that, to so like give a bit more depth to uh, the story uh, itself. There we go. Oof, there we go. Oh my goodness me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, technical issues, never ideal. So yeah. Uh, anyway, I was um, story story uh, story gave an eight. Uh, I, I, I felt like they, I felt like they could have like given the, the film a, about another ten minutes to like to, like help try and expand on some elements of the um, uh, the source material and um, and the Arthurian legend at the same time. Uh, characters, uh, characters. I definitely gave um, characters. I gave a nine. But again, again, that all ties. Again, that all really ties in with um, uh, part of that ties in with the fact that um, I say that I say some of some of the characters could could have used a bit more uh, uh, screen time and was it like I say increase the runtime by about ten minutes. Uh, give a bit more screen time for some of the characters. And uh, I could very well have given could very well have given the given it a ten, but despite that, um, like I mentioned, uh, uh, the comedic elements for the for for uh, Merlin, Archimedes, uh, Madame Mim, as well. I say those three characters as well. They really they really helped add to the uh, comedic side of the um, uh, of the film, Espe especially especially that wizard's duel. Just. So just just the way that Merlin and Archimedes, especially that the way they're able to bounce off each other and uh, the interactions between uh, Merlin, Archimedes, and um, Arthur, the, the way those three interact with each other. And I say overall, as overall, it's just it's overall it's mainly the runtime that's the uh, the main criticism for this um, film for me. But other than that, uh, gr uh, great characters uh, all round, especially. With how irredeemable Hector and uh, Kay were um, portrayed as, <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, visuals uh, visuals also a nine. It's um, as for, uh, on on the animation on the animation standpoint, uh, it's definitely a massive uh, improvement from uh, 101 Dalmatians. But um, but uh, I, I I still feel that the um, I, 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 I just feel like 101 Dalmatians. The the backgrounds aren't as Aren't as polished as like some of the um, some of the previous films, but uh, I think just I think just uh, the um, uh, the transformations during the wizards was like transformations during the wizards duel. The um, uh, what, what else? The um, I say, I say, even even some of the even some of the uh, even like one or two of the songs as well, like um, Merlin packing everything up. I say just. I say, the animation for those two particular scenes as well definitely helped boost that score on the uh, on the visual uh, side of things. But I, I say, uh, what stops it? Get, what stops the um, visuals getting a ten is just mainly uh, the backgrounds not looking as polished as previous um, uh, previous films. But uh, ho hope hopefully that picks up soon. Yeah. Uh, soundtrack definitely. Um, so, so soundtrack. It's soundtrack that's an eight um let's see the songs as short as as short as they are they um they, they definitely help with uh they definitely help with their fl they de they definitely help with driving the story along uh i see the, I see the, the two songs especially of um um uh, merlin teaching uh, Arthur, uh, uh, when he's a fish and when he's a, a squirrel as well. Madam Mim's song is just, I say, I say that, that's just another case of comedy gold. The transformations that Mim's able to pull off, uh, just absolutely, in, in, that's a, abs, absolute comedy gold for that. And, and I say the, um, but of course, 
I've mentioned it numerous times. If you've got a great score alongside a great soundtrack, uh, you're definitely going to be looking at nines, maybe even tens across uh, across the board for for that particular section. But but like I say, um, for one of the sh for one of the um, first projects for the uh, the Sherman Brothers, they did really well with uh, they did really well with the uh, the songs, uh, but the score not. Um, I was like, I was like, it was it was George Burns that did the um, that did the score. Uh, I say like, the score not so much, but uh, but but the songs are the songs are really strong throughout the um, uh, throughout the film. And last but by no means least, we have got the legacy of the film. Um, I say like, the legacy does it. It's a it's a very very strong eight. For the uh, for the legacy um, section, folks, but um, I say, uh, I say it's I say it, it's it's not one of it's not one of the more remem it's it's not one of the more memorable Disney films, if you will. It's 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 not one that's often brought up in um, uh, in, in conversation. But despite that, um, the legacy the film has had, um, I say just. Uh, like, for the reception of the film, uh, we've got uh, during during some of the uh, during some of the re-releases. Was like uh, the initial run, it was uh, just shy of um, five million dollars at the uh, uh, box office in North America, an extra two and a half million during its 1972 re-release, and then it was re-released again in 1983. Uh, it was it was re-released again in uh, 1983 uh, as a double feature with the uh, Winnie the Pooh short, Winnie the Pooh and uh, and a day for Eeyore. Um, but overall, for a three million dollar budget, the lifetime gross of the film was twenty two point two million dollars in North America. I don't have the totals for the worldwide box office total in front of me, but um, as far as the accolades of the film. Uh, a concern. It did receive, it did receive a, a, an Oscar nomination for uh, best score in in 1963, but it ended up losing to um, Irma Irma Laduce, uh, however however in the world you pronounce that. Um, in the it reached the um, was it? It was in the top 50 for the uh, American Film Institute's top 10 animated films list, uh, but it unfortunately didn't make the top 10. Um, several characters from the film made frequent appearances in the uh, uh, TV show House of Mouse, one of them being uh, Merlin. And Madame Mim also appeared as a villain in the spin-off film House of Villains, where you've got all the big Disney villains um, taking over uh, the House of Mouse. Um, Merlin, Merlin's also a, a frequent uh, feature in the uh, the Walt Disney uh, Parks. Uh, occasional meet and greets at the um, at the uh, Disneyland Resort in uh, in California, and then you've got the Walt Disney World in Florida, and he's and he's also the opening unit. He's also, he's also in the opening unit of the uh, Parade of Dreams at the Disneyland Park in uh, California. There's also, a, there's also a sword in the stone ceremony in the uh, King Arthur Carousel attraction in, in the Fantasyland at Disneyland in uh, California. And the Change for Life um, health directive here in the UK, folks, uh, incorporated Higgitas Figgitas as the soundtrack to adverts promoting their Disney-sponsored 10-minute shake-up summer program. So, so there you go, the, the soundtrack being incorporated in an advertising campaign like that. I mean, that I mean that's that's definitely one of the most that's definitely one of the more interesting factoids that I found regarding uh, the film. Uh, they also had some comics as well. Madame was adopted into the Donald Duck. Uh, universe, um, uh, especially when it came to Madame Mim 
being uh, involved. Um, uh, Magicka, Dispel, and all the uh, Beagle Boys, the Beagle Boys uh, uh, henchmen for um, uh, for Pete. She's also been part of the Mickey Mouse franchise where she teamed up with Black Pete on occasion and the Phantom Blot at one point. The Phantom Blot also features in the uh, Epic Mickey uh, games uh, as well. And in the world of video games, there is the there was a video game called World of Illusion, which was, oh my word, oh, that's an old, that, oh my, oh, World of Illusion, that's a blast from the past on the Sega Mega Drive, folks. <laughs> oh, um, M- Madam Mim is one of the bosses in that game. And Merlin is a frequent, was it, Merlin is a, um, uh, has made frequent appearances alongside many other Disney films I've talked about sin- uh, since I started the series over a year ago in the Kingdom Hearts series. I love Kingdom Hearts, folks. Um, Merlin has appeared in Kingdom Hearts, in the Kingdom Hearts series. He's, he was voiced by Jeff Bennett in Kingdom Hearts 2. He appears in the abandoned shack in the first Kingdom Hearts game. He encounters Terra Aqua and Ventus in Birth by Sleep, and he also returns in Kingdom Hearts 3 to where he asks Sora to restore <clears throat> restore uh, Winnie the Pooh's uh, storybook, uh, which is which is like a, a recurring thing throughout um, the Kingdom Hearts series. And he also helps with the uh, Remy's Bistro Remy the Rat from. Ratatouille in Twilight Town because uh, he, he spent he spends a fair bit of his time in Kingdom Hearts 3 at Remy's Bistro just outside having the, ha- having his tea uh, just make sure you don't put too much sugar into it though <laughs> and there's also a live action adaptation coming uh, soon there's a live action adaptation. You've got uh, Brian Cogman writing the script, Brigham Taylor as the producer, and Juan Carlos Fresnadillo, who's going to be the director. And that live action adaptation is going to be coming to Disney+. Plus. But at the end of the day, uh, as far as the score for the legacy is concerned, like I say, it's, a, it's, it's an eight, which, which don't get me wrong. I say it's a, it's a great film. It's a lot of fun. But like I said, it's not one of the more memorable films that are, that are talked about as far as some of the best Disney films that have ever been made. Um, so we've done all the calculations, um, added, added up the scores and converted it to the appropriate percentage. And we have a score of 84%, which is sort of like middle of the road for, um, uh, for the films that I've talked about so far. So right, I'll say effectively right smack bang effectively bang in the middle it's uh, tied with uh, 101 dalmatians for eighth place um on the on the list at the moment but uh, despite that um overall would we recommend this film yeah absolutely it's let's say, let's say unless there's a very specific reason for not recommending the film uh i will explain the reasons why not not so watch the film, but uh, I say the World War II package films are probably the ones I would probably just skip over, uh, if anything. But I say Sword in the Stone, this one, um, if if you want to introduce the kids, to, if you want to introduce the youngsters to uh, the Arthurian legend in animation form, Sword in the Stone's a great starting point. And you've also got other adaptations like Quest for Camelot uh, as well. I say that, that's another uh, adaptation of the um, uh, Arthurian legend. But um, but yeah, there, there we go. That is um, that is it for uh, Sword in the Stone. Uh, Ali, thanks very much uh, for joining me, and I'm looking forward to having you back on board to cover an an all time classic in uh, the Jungle Book. Hopefully, in the next uh, couple of weeks or so. But of course, I need to get this yeah. I need to get this episode edited and put together before I even think about recording for the um, <clears throat> uh, for the Jungle Book. But uh, I will say this as one li- as one last little note. Uh, this was, the, um, I will say, during the production of uh, Jungle Book, that was when uh, Walt Disney had actually uh, passed away. He had passed away before the Jungle Book was uh, released. Um, but 
but at the end, but despite that, um, the Jungle Book, um, the Jungle Book to me is a great send off for um, uh, for for Disney, despite him not actually being there to be able to see it um, as a finished product. But yeah, I'll say, Ali, thanks very much for uh, thanks very much for joining me on, uh, for this episode. You're welcome. As I'm looking forward to having you back for um, uh, for the Jungle Book in a, in a in a couple of weeks' time, and especially having Beth with you to cover Aladdin during the Renaissance period. I will get there eventually, folks. Uh, yeah, thanks, Fred. appreciate that. It was fun doing the review with you. Yeah, good thing. Because I say definitely looking forward to doing the Jungle Book with you uh, next time. Uh, so if you enjoyed this, folks, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be Dream Chasers like us, hit the subscribe button down at the bottom. Click the bell to join the Dream Chasers notification squad so you don't miss anything that we do uh, that I do on this channel. I'm going to have Ali back next time for the um, for the Jungle Book, which was released in 1967. And uh, and on that note, folks, we will see you guys next time in the Kingdom of Isolation. <laughs>